from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. The investor community is finally realizing that the return on invested capital for the AI build-out is going to take some time. Because the payback period of AI investments is not akin to the dopamine rush from completing a great workout or closing a big deal, the market for the big AI names has swooned recently. But the big internet giants remain unfazed and seem to believe that the risk of missing out on the AI boom is greater than over-rotating on the opportunity. And as such, the CapEx outlays related to AI, including buying land, building out data centers, and procuring GPUs, continue to escalate. Now, on the demand side of the equation, enterprises are not so aggressive. While AI experimentation continues, the results, although promising, are not yet meaningful enough to the income statements. Now, layoffs remain noticeable. AI initiatives are squeezing other projects, and CFOs are being cautious. The markets seem confused. But we've seen this dynamic in previous waves, and more turbulence is likely until, as we've said numerous times, AI throws off enough cash to be self-funding. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we check in on the latest data to try and bring some clarity to what's happening in markets generally and hyperscaler trends specifically. Now, global markets triggered panic and investors started to sell AI. The Bank of Japan made a surprise move by hiking its benchmark rate. Long-standing low rates in Japan have supported the so-called carry trade, which is the practice of borrowing cheaper yen to invest in higher yielding assets. This triggered a 12% drop in the Nikkei, bringing back memories of Black Monday from 1987, I remember it well, combined with Buffett selling a big chunk of his Apple holdings, renewed recession fears and rumors of Blackwell delays and, of course, Middle East tensions, investors, or maybe algos, decided to lock in profits from inflated AI stocks. Now, the Nasdaq dipped, dipped nearly 15% off its July highs as the world began to realize that Gen AI will take some time to pay off. Fear of a dot-com repeat, of course, didn't help, but Jassy, Nadella, Pichai, and Zuck aren't flinching. They still firmly believe the AI wave. They believe in it. They have the cash and the resources to lead the charge, and they're not taking their feet off the gas pedal. Now, 2024 CapEx spend is approaching hyperscale revenue. Let that sink in. In other words, the amount of money this year that the big three U.S. companies are spending on CapEx, CapEx alone, is roughly comparable to their combined revenues uh, for cloud. Now, of course, the CapEx is an investment that's going to pay off over many, many, many years. But still, it's a stark comparison. Now, if there's any question that these CEOs of Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft, and Meta are all in, all you have to do is look at their respective CapEx spend. And here are the approximate figures for CapEx for those uh, uh, four companies for 2023 and 2024. Now, combined, as we said, they'll approach $200 billion this year. Now, granted, some of that spend is not for AI or data center build-outs, but most of it is going to acquire land, build data centers, and get their hands on GPUs. And as we'll show later, the revenue, again, generated by the hyperscalers is forecast by the Cube Research to be just over $200 billion this year, compared to $195 billion spent by these four players on CapEx. Now, in regards to the dot-com comparisons, while many similarities exist, the build-out in that era had some pretty shaky companies funding the capital expenditures. Enron, they collapsed due to accounting fraud. WorldCom, Global Crossing, and North Point all went bankrupt. Now, so did Pets.com, which became the poster child for crummy business models in that era. Now, we are seeing some cracks in the AI armor. For example, the Inflection AI deal with Microsoft, where the latter is picking up employees from the former and doing licensing deals to skirt around the M&A friction that would come from the DOJ or the FTC. And there are other examples, so we'll see if this blows up. But we think the foundation is much more stable than it was in the dot-com due to stronger balance sheets in this wave. 
and the cloud players uh, having much more disciplined managements. Now, one other thought on AI ROI. Meta has shown some real promise and didn't get punished for spending so much on CapEx and not getting a return because we think the reason is they are getting faster ROI. And that is the nature of consumer. In consumer, the bigger the GPU clusters you can build, the better ad targeting you can do and the more revenue you can make. And so because of their scale, they're seeing some strong returns from AI more quickly than you might expect in the enterprise. Now, enterprise customers, let's talk about them. They're not as aggressive. Customers in this segment are not as eager to open up checkbooks. This graphic here from ETR shows annual tech spending growth expectations from more than 1,700 IT decision makers, or call ITDMs, at different points in time. So this is the annual expectation and the snapshot in time over, over quarters that we surveyed. We exited 2023 with ITDMs expecting 4.3% growth. That, for, for 2024, that level moderated in the Q2 survey, uh, ETR's Q2 survey, to 3.4%. And the July survey came in at 3.7%, a little bit of an uptick. But spending acceleration continues to be weighted toward the back half of the year, Q4 specifically, which causes us to remain cautious despite this recent uptick. Now, as we've talked about before, AI is just continuing to dominate the, the spending momentum. And this chart shows the dis distribution of responses from that same 1,700 ITDMs in the latest ETR spending survey. The data on the vertical axis re represents net score or spending momentum. And the horizontal axis shows pervasion. Kind of a funny word, but it's talking about the pervasiveness of a sector in the data set. It's sort of a proxy for account penetration within the sector. That red line at 40% indicates a highly elevated spending level. Anything above that is considered substantially elevated. Now, data from previous surveys prior to the introduction of chat GPT show that the spending velocity in cloud, RPA, and container sectors were all above that 40% mark and pretty comparable um, from a position-wise on that vertical axis. Now, despite some of the headwinds, cloud optimization is waning, and of course, AI demand is soaring. So despite the fact that AI is dominating the conversation and often, as we've reported, siphoning funds from other projects, the hyperscalers are seeing strong momentum. Now, while Microsoft's Azure business came in below the high end of estimates, including our estimates, it still grew 30% in constant currency year over year. Google Cloud performed very well, and and, and AWS saw accelerated growth at 19% relative to roughly 17% last quarter. That's sequential growth. Before we dig into the specific revenue data for the cloud, though, let's take a look at the spending profiles from ETR of the big three U.S. hyperscalers. So in this chart, we show from the latest survey that ETR did, Amazon, Microsoft Azure, or I should say AWS, um, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud. We also show some additional data, including in the bottom right, including several companies with exposure, high exposure to on-prem. We did that as a point of comparison. I always like to do this just to test, you know, sort of that repatriation theory. Focus for a moment on the colored bar charts, and we'll start in the upper left with AWS. What we're showing here is the net score granularity from ETR's July survey. Now, net score is a measure of spending momentum based on the percent of customers that are spending in a certain way, these buckets that I'll explain. In the case of AWS, we're sampling 1,012 AWS customers. The lime green represents the percent of those 1,000 plus customers that are new ads to, for AWS. The forest green shows the percent of those customers spending 6% or more. The gray is plus or minus 5%. Pink is spending, again, percentage of those customers spending 6% or worse. And the red is the percent of those customers that are churning. You subtract the reds from the greens and you get net score, which is for AWS, 51.6%. And that's shown on that blue line. Again, anything over 40% is considered highly elevated. The yellow is a penetration in the survey, but I don't want to focus on that for now. Now, to the right of AWS, we show Azure, 
at a net score of 63.7%. And the bottom left is Google Cloud with a 44% net score. Note that all three U.S. hyperscalers are seeing an uptrend in momentum, that blue line. You can see that uptick uh, within the current survey relative to the last survey. Now, on the bottom right, we show the July data for these three juxtaposed to some of the proxies for vendors with on-premises exposure. We're showing both net score in the first column and the ends, the ends in the survey, which indicate penetration into the data set. And you can see the ends are, are big. This is a, a large survey. It's very representative. So for the ends, bigger means more prominent presence in the data set. Notice the three hyperscalers are all above that 40% mark. We've got them in green. Uh, we chose a bit of a different cut, so they're not exactly going to match the bar charts, net scores. But the point is their momentum is substantially above the bellwethers of the on-prem, which is Dell, HPE, Oracle, IBM, and, of course, VMware, which is in a major transition. I could have put Cisco in there as well. That would have been a, a good indicator. But you would have seen, again, somewhat you know, less robust in net scores. Remember, net score methodology is based on customer counts, not revenue. And because Broadcom's strategy is to narrow the account base and charge more and invest more, uh, that's their stated strategy, they're naturally going to see contraction in, in the ETR survey from a net score perspective. But their end was substantial. I think uh, if you go back to that chart for a moment, I think it was around uh, 800 or so. And so uh, what's happening is fewer customers are going to be spending more on VMware. You're going to get a contraction in that percentage. Um, but that doesn't that actual dollar amount won't show in the survey. And you're going to get a larger percentage is going to like, hold spending flat or even try to spend less or even migrate off the, the platform. We're, of course, hearing a lot of that. She had shared some data in, in previous breaking analysis uh, that show that. And as such... Broadcom VMware net score, that's going to be compressed and decelerate. The point is, despite talk of repatriation or even AI you know, on-prem, most of the AI work is still being done today in the cloud. And while Dell, HPE, Supermicro, they have strong demand for AI servers, much of that's going to service providers, MSPs, at least for now. Now, let's turn our attention to the big four IS and PaaS revenue. Uh, we like to focus on that. We do basically a quarterly update. Um, they're going to surpass $200 billion in 2024 based on our estimates. So we continue to refine our models for hyperscale revenue. Uh, our focus is to really try to achieve an apples-to-apples -apples comparison across the vendors. We try to be as transparent as possible as to how we do that. And here we show our updated annual figures for 2023 and 2024, which is an estimate, of course. Uh, but we are halfway through the year, so we wanted to show you the full year estimate. So some key points of the clarification relative to the, our definitions and the methodology. We anchor our, our Microsoft Azure IaaS and PaaS data on the leaked court documents from the Activision trial. And you might recall that leak said that for their fiscal 2023, which is the last two quarters of 2022 calendar year and the first two quarters of 2023 calendar year, uh, came in at $34 billion uh, for, for IaaS slash PaaS, Azure. We squint through the data, and that's what we decided to pin the numbers on. So we mapped to those. So we try to make a unified comparison across all three cloud vendors. And as such, our estimates are lower for Azure than what many other firms uh, have, because oftentimes they'll just take uh, what Microsoft says their cloud revenue is. Oh, our cloud was... X, they don't attempt to say, all right, well, how much of that was actually IaaS and PaaS because they're including some other stuff in there. Some, some of the research firms actually do make do the work and try to make an attempt to reconcile. But anyway, we, we do try to reconcile those to those leaked documents um, and to try to create an apples to apples with, say, AWS and Google. We also adjust our GCP figures down from what Google reports on its overall cloud business. So we're trying to exclude SaaS from Google's numbers, both Microsoft and Google. Microsoft in its in its uh, overall cloud number, and Google in its overall cloud number, probably half of that number is, is SaaS. We believe we have 
made estimates for each company across IS, PaaS, SaaS, and services at a more granular level, and we can make that data available. Just you know, get in touch with us. No, all these figures again map, or not again, but map to Amazon's public statements, the one we're showing here. So they overstate AWS's figures a little bit, probably three to four billion dollars in 2024, because it includes a small amount of SaaS, for instance, Chime and a little bit of Q. Some professional services are in there, and over time we're going to report those out. But in the interest of time for this breaking analysis, we've maintained our historical um, uh, reporting for this episode. But you know, again, in the spirit of transparency, we note that. Now, as it relates to the market, a couple of key points are worth noting. The market for these four players is going to surpass $200 billion this year based on our estimates. Growth is accelerating and is going to approach 22% relative to 2023. That's remarkable for a base that large. Cloud optimization, as we, as we said, is waning. It's still in play. You know, Jamie Jesse uses the term attenuating. We agree, much lower levels than it was in 2022, but it is still a thing, and it will be, um, probably indefinitely, uh, because it's part of the muscle memory of customers, uh, but there's only so much blood you could squeeze from the stone. Now, Amazon maintains revenue share, based on our model, above 50%. Again, we're only counting these top four players, so they, Amazon has half the market within that cohort. Um, and that's, again, remember, based on our methodology and mapping to those leaked court, doc court documents for Azure. Cloud continues to outpace on-premises growth by a wide margin. Most of the legacy players are growing in the low to mid-single digits or in some cases contracting. And while the cloud growth of 20% plus um, is on a base of $168 billion in 2023, it's accelerating from last year. Now, we continue to dig deeper into these figures and we'll share more granularity uh, over time, uh, but that's our latest update. So let's end, let's kind of squint through the uncertainty, if you will. We'll give you some final thoughts and that we're going to leave you with today. CFOs, you know, this is not opening the checkbook because of AI. They're keeping a tight leash on overall IT spending, which remains pretty tepid. It's basically GDP plus a point. Uh, you know, you'd like to see it a little bit higher. We've seen some other estimates, particularly from Gartner and IDC, that are significantly higher than our mid-threes. And we suspect it's because, well, we're not really sure, uh, we'll, but we just say this. We're including all spending. So we include in our spending, spending on staff. We include, of course, spending on professional services. So many times firms will augment their own staff with spending on professional services. So from an apples to apples standpoint, we think it makes sense to include spending on internal staff. It's part of the IT equation. It's also part of the TAM because customers will spend on technology to remove uh, uh, labor efforts. Um, mm -hmm. They'll spend dollars to save time and, and effort. Um, so look, while CEOs or CFOs are keeping a tight rein on things, at the same time, CEOs are demanding that firms build a, a, a high impact AI strategy that drives productivity and growth. And the corner office and the board wants to know, what's your AI strategy? And so <laughs> you've got that sort of dueling tension, if you will. And remember, we've reported before, Gen AI is stealing from other budgets. So 44% of the customers tell us that Gen AI is, the, the budget for Gen AI is coming from other places. So you also have to remember driving value from Gen AI is, takes time. It's, it's an iterative process. You got to experiment to gain experience. You got to prioritize your use cases. You got to worry about your data quality. You got to improve that. You have to test different models. You know, today, Llama's looking great. Open AI, we're waiting for GPT-5, uh, which, you know, I'm hearing is maybe not living up to expectations. You know, you're hearing about Blackwell delays, so that's going to affect models. Who gets who gets Blackwell first? So that that race is on. You got to try different techniques to improve your results. You got to manage security, privacy, compliance, and governance along the way, and then you have to keep iterating. So this is you know this is part of the reason why Gen, Gen AI ROI is not 
super inspiring so far in the enterprise. Now, cloud, as we said, is outpacing on-premises growth and is a primary beneficiary of most of this AI experimentation. We think that'll continue for a while, but look, we're in a transition from the old to the new, and we've seen this before, where the softness in legacy IT, and it is soft, uh, it's just a lot of times it's hidden uh, because these companies are so big, but you think about some of the SaaS models that are outdated, you look at what's happening in, in VMware and the transitions that are going on there. Um, there's there's an interesting sort of war of words going on between the likes of Microsoft and CrowdStrike versus Delta Airlines, where uh, the former two are sort of, you know, defending their position uh, that it wasn't completely their fault that Delta couldn't recover. They're blaming in part, legacy infrastructure. Of course, you know, they know the issue was caused by CrowdStrike and Microsoft had a hand in that as well. Uh, but other airlines recovered. They're saying, they being Microsoft and CrowdStrike, that the legacy systems of Delta was part of that reason, part of that issue. So, you know, as companies modernize, they're not going to spend as much on the old as the new. So what's happening is there's, we're in transition. The new is still relatively small. It's not throwing off a ton of cash. Um, and the old is big and it's in decline. And so when, when we're in these transitions, this is what we get. We get this uncertainty. We certainly saw this. You go back to the mainframe era. You saw this in the transition to the microprocessor-based revolution where mainframes and mini computers um, um, didn't make the transition. And the many of the managements of those companies were kind of navel gazing and, and got caught off guard. The internet had somewhat similar dynamics, although it wasn't maybe as disruptive, it was more an opportunity to take advantage of. The cloud was very clearly dilutive to on-prem infrastructure. And so we're seeing again um, the investments in AI taking away from other other areas. It's not just open the checkbooks. Um, and so that causes some confusion in markets. Stock markets expect, you know, instant gratification. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and so we're kind of in a bit of a vacuum right now. And I would, I would add one other thing is that managements today are much more capable of navigating, you know, through that transition than were the likes of many companies that most of you probably haven't heard of. Data General, Prime, Wang, even Digital Equipment Corporation, which at one time <laughs> was a darling, along with companies like Sun Microsystems, who actually made it through that transition, but was no longer around. So these things happen, these transitions occur. They can be sometimes, they almost always are nonlinear and choppy. And so, as always, we'll, we'll be here to help you focus on what's real and what's noise. All right, that's it for now. Thanks to uh, Alex Meyerson, who produced this episode, and Ken Schiffman, who are on production here in our, outside, in our offices in our studio outside of Boston. They also do our podcast, Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight, help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hoff is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcasts. I publish each week. On thecuberesearch.com and theSiliconAngle.com, you can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante if you got some ideas or you want to pitch me or comment on our LinkedIn posts. Please do check out etr.ai. They keep up in their game, doing some wonderful work, best survey data and data science in the enterprise tech business from a research standpoint. Thanks for watching. This is Dave Vellante for the Q Research Insights powered by ETR. We'll see you next time.